we looked at three general points there. Um, first was looking at industry stakeholders need to appreciate the consumer confidence online um, that that confidence is at a point kind of a tipping point and the industry participants need to realize that appreciate the confidence people have but then realize that there is some erosion there and then number two what's the industry doing to police themselves and number three what should the self-regulatory guidelines be? So those are more or less the points where we had our uh, first discussion and then the end of the month we're going to, good morning, uh, we're going to continue this discussion out in California. But um, I, I want to say first of all that I appreciate that you all have a an attitude of being proactive about this issue and it's important to us because of the looking at the virtual marketplace and the role that is going to play in a 21st century economy the role it is going to play in innovation in in job creation and we're at a time with uh, over 9% unemployment and a lot of underemployment. And because of that, um, the people are wanting to, they're looking for certainty within the regulatory framework. And um, I, I think that there is a way for the industry to step up in and help with that. What I'd like to do is just uh, for our participants to begin and let everyone at the table introduce themselves and say who you are with and then we'll move into our discussion for the morning and some questions and answers here. Jim Harper with the Cato Institute. Uh, good morning. I'm Larry Downs with Tech Freedom. I'm Howard Beals. I'm in the business school at George Washington University and was the head of consumer protection at the FTC when we did the Do Not Call list. Uh, Darren Soka with Tech Freedom. Tom Leonard with the Technology Policy Institute. Randy May, president of the Free State Foundation. Daniel Castro with the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Ryan Roddy with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Well, thank you all so very much. And as you can see, uh, CVC doesn't put out enough chairs or enough microphones. <laughs> So I guess we will uh, deal with this in our very expensive uh, space where we are right, right now this, this morning. Uh, thank goodness they don't build out the internet like they uh, build out the space, right? Um, I and Josh Lynch from my team is here, Mike Renard is uh, also here, and Margaret Tipton is uh, somewhere around also. Um, I, I want to just um, start with, with a couple of um, questions and kind of direct our uh, discussion based on where, where we left off um, more or less the last time with, within our discussion. Jim, I think I'm going to come to you first. Um, we hear a lot right now as we look at the FCC trying to move into data protection and privacy and the FTC um, and you know there is a discussion that is taking place a kind of an ancillary discussion that is what is sensitive data what is uh, personally identified data PII I want you to hit that for just a minute and give us your take on that what should it be and where where should we think toward these firewalls well sure thanks um, for your question and thanks for having all of us here I, I illustrate well that some of the biggest uh, challenges in technology are user uh, challenges I was back from two and a half weeks of travel last night and set my alarm for 7 p.m. today. So I apologize for not uh, hearing every word of your introduction. But, yeah. uh, but the problems, as you suggested by your question, a lot of the problems are definitional. Uh, what is personally identifiable information? Can you categorically say that a thing like an IP address is, is uh, 
personally identifiable. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, so the definitional problems are hardest. And I think one of the most important um, things to define is privacy itself. People use the word all the time and are actually referring to a variety of different interests. Uh, I've tried to, to, to capture them, categorize them, and one, I think the mo one of the most important and central to privacy is control of personal information. Is a person being deprived wrongly of control of information that they wanted to, to keep to themselves? A lot of open questions, even just within that definition. But people are also worried about fairness. That is, uh, is the information that's out there being used appropriately to make good decisions? Is the data high enough quality to make decisions about them, given the gravity of the decision? Lots to work on within that, that definition. Uh, in addition, personal security, identity fraud, or identity theft, if you prefer, it goes to whether a person's finances are secure because their reputation is well protected. Uh, personal information can also be used to, to uh, do violence to a person, and some of, the, some of the laws that have been passed, including the Driver's Privacy Protection Acts around the country and at the federal level, were prompted by um, people attacking other people, using, having gotten information about them online or in the case of the driver's bills, uh, rather driver's laws, uh, getting them from departments of motor vehicles. Also seclusion, being left alone is a different but important privacy interest. And I think that was primarily pursued by um, Howard and the FTC at the time with the, do, with the do not call list, leaving people alone when they want to be left alone. Spam's another incursion on that kind of privacy. And then there's liberty or autonomy. Uh, the idea that, uh, so you see this in Supreme Court cases that talk about privacy. And you also think about it when it comes to going to the airport. Should you, should you have to share information with the government in order to travel? Um, that's yet another question. All of these are referred to as privacy, so sometimes we have conversations that, where we think we agree but we're actually talking about different things or we disagree because we're not sure exactly what we're talking about. Defining all these problems is very important and lots of the pro-privacy regulation that you've seen uh, hasn't actually fixed on a particular interest that it pursues and so the results are, are rather diffuse. Okay, Howard, do you want to weigh in on that? Well, I think, um, I, I mean, I think what's, what's probably the most important uh, aspect of privacy from, from a, a legislative perspective in particular is concern about the consequences of information use and misuse. Uh, when information is used in a way that is harmful to people, uh, that is something where uh, there, there, there ought to be a remedy uh, that, uh, that, that people can prevent that use uh, or, or uh, get redress uh, if the use occurs, but, but that couldn't have been prevented. Um, but we really need to pay attention to what kinds of consequences we're trying to control and what are the bad things we're worried about happening, uh, because that's the only way we can really focus on a solution that can address those problems. Uh, if, we, if we aren't clear, and I, I really echo Jim's point here, if we, if we aren't clear about what it is we're trying to stop, we're not likely to be very successful. Okay. Tom. Yeah, pass that single microphone down there. Uh, I think I, I guess I think there's this kind of in, in this in this van. I think there's a distinction between what I might call privacy, even though it's hard to define, and security. I think people don't have people don't have um, are not that upset about if their information is used for uh, intended pur their, the intended purposes, but people are do get upset. If the information is is not secure, and and that's what, and and I think when you ask people, uh, you know, what's what's the thing that they're most concerned about? It's uh, you know, it's, it's somebody gets their credit card number. So I, I think there's a there's a uh, when we look at when we look at legislative solutions, we should kind of try to separate out the security aspect from the from the privacy aspect. So okay. I, I, I can Yes, please. I, I would also add, uh, I think it's good that Tom and Howard are focusing on breaking down the constituent parts of the problem. As Howard will tell you, when we talk about harm here, I'm sure you know, we are not necessarily always talking about monetary harm. There are other kinds of harms that could be cognizable. But I think the point that probably all of us would agree on is that there has to be some rigor in defining harm, and the harm can't be conjectural. There has to be some evidence that it is actually uh, a problem. But to take a step back, I, I think the way I look at this is to say that um, when, when people, uh, when Howard here talks about the potential for data abuse, that's certainly uh, true that that can happen, but it really is because data is so powerful. So the first point that I would make here is to say that data is powerful, and data can be both uh, dangerous and also beneficial in that sense. So all the, uh, the things that we think of when we think about the, the potential for data abuse demonstrate the power of data on the other side of the equation. 
there are many benefits of data. And broadly speaking, I would say that those come into um, a few broad categories. The obvious one that gets talked about a lot here, although not researched nearly enough, as, as Howard and Tom will tell you when they mention their research, is uh, the value of data in advertising that supports media. Uh, but there's more to the equation than that. There is also the fact that data really is the vital commodity that drives uh, services on the internet and innovation increasingly in our information economy. And so very specifically, what we're talking about here is not just reducing ad revenue for sites that depend on it, some of whom really wouldn't exist without it, uh, but also services that simply could never be developed without the ability to make unexpected, unanticipated uses of data. And some of those are not necessarily uh, money makers, but they may be very socially beneficial. And I just would give you one example of that, which is uh, flu trends, which is a service that predicts uh, flu outbreaks in real time based on what people are searching for uh, on the internet. And that's the sort of service that if a company were required to ahead of time specify all the purposes for which it might use data or to minimize the data that it collects and, and stores, might never have been developed. And so that's the sort of value that we uh, are worried about here when we talk about uh, prophylactic sweeping regulation. Thanks. Ryan, I want to come to you. As we look at the value of data and the work that you all are doing, do you want to weigh in on, on that, the work that you all are doing at Competitive Enterprise and how you, what kind of access you need to that data? And then, um, how you're going to be able to look toward monetizing uh, the information that comes from that data. Thank you. The value of data, as Baron said, is remarkable. And in many ways, data is an untapped resource. We've just begun to explore and make use of the many ways in which data can make the world a better place by aggregating individualized information, analyzing it, not just delivering services, but also socially beneficial things, such as flu trends. The challenge is to embrace the notion that as we collect this information and use it, there will be some risks along the way. We need to be prudent about managing those risks, but also acknowledge the importance of not reducing our ability to use this information. If we go down the path of regulating data collection, we will constrain a novel set of ways in which we can make the world a better place through use of data, as, especially as computing power increases. S various legislative proposals need to be considered to make that possible. Things like safe harbors for the responsible use of anonymized data sets need to be explored, along with a lot of other options for ensuring that the actors that are trying to use this data responsibly in a way that minimizes the risk of harm, don't do not face crushing liability or regulatory burdens. Could, could I just just chime in sure. with an example? I think of the uh, of, of the sort of the incidental uses of data, uh, and and that's fraud control, uh, a, a, a clearly beneficial objective, uh, and a lot of the information is is sort of a completely secondary use that's used in these models to try to identify uh, uh, potentials for fraud. Uh, for example, um, among the inputs are things like subscription lists. Um, to, and and, and what, the, the, what the way the fraud control tools work is they look for inconsistencies in the way a particular name is being used that's not consistent with the pattern of how you usually use your name, or it doesn't go with the right address that, that is usually used with that name. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it's a way to flag transactions that may be suspicious uh, and seek out more information in those cases. But, you know, the subscription list itself is, is, it, it is important as the source, but it's a completely incidental use of the data. It has, you know, there, there's no way you could identify that as a purpose of the co collecting the, uh, the, the, your name uh, for a magazine subscription. Well, let's take... A right there, come right off of your comment. What would a pro-data approach to data abuse prevention be? What should that look like as we as policymakers look at a definition of this, as we have this debate about where the FTC moves? So if we're going to say there is value in this data, we need the access 
to this data, innovators need access uh, to, to bring forward the next generation of um, a use like flu trends. So if we're going to take that approach, then what would a uh, pro-data approach to data abuse prevention look like, Larry? So uh, that's a great question. I think there are a couple of, of key principles to think about, and, and frankly, this is exactly what we've done in the United States very successfully. Uh, we have a very pro-data regime, uh, partly to, from the fact that we haven't passed a lot of very uh, sweeping and broad privacy regulations. We have some very specific protections, health information, credit information, and so on, but nothing uh, broad, for example, as, as there would be in the European Union. At the same time, we've also created a number of safe harbors for information uses. So Section 230 of the Communications Act, uh, which allows you know, protection for third-party liability, uh, is a form of safe harbor. There's also safe harbors in the, in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that help to uh, make possible uh, applications like uh, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and, and other things that rely on essentially third-party data for their entire existence and certainly without being able to literally check every fact and, and police every piece of information. And that sort of a regime, which is, I think, you know, very uh, uh, generous in terms of giving room to experiment, has worked extremely well in the United States. That's where these innovations happen. That's not a, it, it's not a coincidence. So following that particular model, what we'd like to see is kind of continued, as Barron said before, when there is a cognizable harm, when there really is uh, a, a very identifiable misuse of data, what I think of as a destructive use of data where it takes value away from the information rather than adding to it, uh, that's an opportunity, in fact, a, a, a necessary condition in which government should act. Uh, and we should look for those problems and then we should look for solutions that are carefully crafted just to solve those particular problems and avoid, as, as you said, Congressman, at your opening statement, the unintended consequences which can come from broad regulations may be well intended but actually uh, wind up uh, blocking innovation that, because we can't predict it uh, far enough in the future. Okay, Jim. If I can add, uh, the existence of, of law already that is, is rather pro-data while being harm-based is the suggestion that both uh, Howard and Barron correctly talked about. Uh, that's the common law privacy torts adopted over nearly 100 years since the original Right to Privacy article in, in the Harvard Law Review and summarized in the mid-60s by Dean Prosser at, at Berkeley. Um, that's baseline privacy legislation that seeks out when somebody has used data or information in analog form, whatever the case, uh, to do something really harmful, to do something really bad and invasive. Uh, Minnesota finally adopted the privacy torts in its own Supreme Court maybe around a decade ago um, because somebody in one of those auto photo mat shops, which they had a decade ago, um, <laughs> came across some pictures that were intimate vacation pictures and passed them around, a violation of the, of the, the privacy that people had when they, the court found when they, when, you, when they do that kind of thing. Think of the other privacy violations, the true privacy violations that have, that have happened recently. The case in Rutgers, at Rutgers University, where someone uploaded imagery of someone engaging in sexual relations. That's a genuine privacy. You know, we, we sometimes argue around the margins about is my information about my surfing going to be seen by somebody. Um, that's a true mortifying privacy offense. And there was certainly, there's certainly civil liability for that kind of behavior and probably criminal liability in that case. Baseline privacy law is already there for the real genuine privacy, mortifying privacy violations that are out there. It's important to remember that. Okay. Yes, Randy. Uh, I think all of that was uh, put very well, Ju and just to put it in a different frame or, di or different terms that I think have a lot of salience today uh, when we're thinking about uh, the marketplace and jobs and so forth, I, I think an important fundamental underpinning or tenet of a, of a framework has to uh, have in it the notion of uh, sound cost benefit analysis. I mean, we've talked about that, I think, implicitly and in, in the harms, but I think, you know, this area, like so many others, when we're talking about potential regulations, I think, I think just thinking about it in terms of the cost on the one hand and the benefits and, and weighing those uh, in societal terms and, and 
and, and getting away from, from basing policy just on an anecdote or the worst potential case is an important thing to, to have in mind. Okay, Tom? Yeah, let me, I know Harold has a comment. Let me just, uh, uh, taking off to, uh, on what Randy said, I mean, the, the, uh, from what, what, we're, what most of the legislative and proposals and what most of the poli policy discussion is about is about the use of, uh, the use of, uh, of, um, of information for commercial purposes. Okay, and so, and so it does, it, it seems to me that a necessary condition for, for, for going forward is uh, a demonstration of harms that, that, that people are actually being harmed by the use of commercial information for online marketing and advertising and all of those things. Now, to my knowledge, there, I haven't seen any demonstration. I mean, there are, there are vague statements that, you know, people feel creepy about it and, and stuff like that, but it really never get, gets very much more specific than that. Kind of by definition, if there are no, uh, the definition of benefits of a privacy regulation would be a reduction in the harms. If, there, if you can't demonstrate harms, then it's very difficult to demonstrate benefits. Okay, Harold? Congressman, as you know, there are uh, millions of Americans who are unemployed. Um, there are tens of millions of Americans who are looking for better jobs. Um, they're looking to Washington to uh, uh, move the country forward. Uh, and I think there's a, a wide sense in America that uh, uh, we have a lot of regulations that aren't necessarily helpful. Part of the problem of regulation is that, and of laws is once they're put in place, they're very, very difficult to get rid of. Um, and I, I think that in any consideration you have about legislation regarding privacy, it's important to keep in mind the uh, substantially evolving concepts of privacy. If one were to look 100 years ago, the concept of privacy would have been substantially different. And if Congress had passed a law to define privacy or privacy control, it would have been substantially different. It was widely considered a, a state issue at the time. It was only in the 60s, as Jim was describing, that the federal interest in privacy emerged. If one were to have gone 16 years ago and defined privacy, practically all of the concepts we're discussing today would not have been present at all. Uh, yeah, I would just urge you to think very carefully about, and I, I commend you for your um, having these discussions and, and being very thoughtful and careful before moving forward. And I, I wish some of your other colleagues in Congress were holding these sessions as well, uh, because it's important um, that if there are new laws, that um, they, they be, as, as Randy described, ones that have clear benefits that exceed the costs. Um, and that is very difficult to do when you're dealing with something that, that changes as rapidly as, as privacy and the Internet do. Um, and uh, any laws that are put in place today will not just be around uh, immediately, but, but they will be around for a long time. Uh, I would just urge you to think about what if Congress had passed laws dealing with um, telecommunications in the 1840s after the invention of the, of the telegraph um, and that uh, you know, we would still be having those. And as recently as 10 years ago, the FCC, in fact, still had a great many regulations dealing with telegraphy. Um, these laws and the regulations that, they, that are promulgated under them, they live for a very long time. And they have consequences of meaning that millions of Americans uh, find it very difficult to, uh, to find jobs. There's serious consequences to writing laws without a very clear understanding that, that the benefits, in fact, exceed the cost. Okay, thanks. And Barron, I know you have... Uh, well, Congressman, I, I would certainly echo uh, Randy and, uh, and Harold's point about cost-benefit analysis. Uh, let me say that the approach that uh, we uh, at Tech Freedom and at previously at the Progress and Freedom Foundation laid out was, uh, along with Adam Thera, was, was essentially what everyone has said today, which is first and foremost identifying some harm, some, con some cognizable, non-conjectural problem. Uh, second, uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis. And third, proving that there really isn't a, a less restrictive alternative to the particular regulation that we're talking about. 
And on that point, I would say that I, I think the biggest problem in the conversation about privacy today is the emphasis on silver bullet, comprehensive, sweeping solutions. And I think what you would probably hear from everybody today is that what is needed instead is really a layered approach that operates on a number of levels that includes uh, market forces such as reputation, which disciplines companies, the enforcement of existing laws such as the FTC's authority to punish unfair and deceptive trade practices, as well as uh, existing state tort laws. Uh, but also uh, other forces at work here, um, like for example, uh, we would argue that the clearest uh, harm to consumers here comes not from the private sector, but from government access to data. So part of this conversation needs to be about ensuring that Americans are protected by the Fourth Amendment, which was intended to balance the interests of order and liberty by ensuring that law enforcement can get access to data, but can do so only by going through a court and getting a warrant. And unfortunately, as, as many people here know today, that is not the case, uh, despite the Sixth Circuit's decision in Rorschach. So many of the groups here today have argued for reforming the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, or ECPA, in order to ensure that the data that is collected by companies is more protected from government access and that the courts ensure that, uh, that we still have a, a judicial scrutiny process. But second, we've argued that, just as in the case of free speech, uh, where these debates go on, there is a, a range of other alternatives, and those begin with um, their e-words. And first and foremost, there is consumer education, which I cannot emphasize enough is a function that the FTC has done uh, in the past, something that can be done better. And indeed, I would probably say if there's money to be spent here, it's on educating people about privacy problems. Second is empowering users to manage privacy preferences for themselves, because ultimately here, Jim's point when we started this conversation, is that privacy is profoundly and deeply subjective. And so in that world, we want to empower users who are deeply sensitive to, to opt out, to make those choices, but not to set a, a least common denominator standard that costs everybody else more. Uh, and third, I would say we need to enhance self-regulation. Uh, I think industry certainly could do a lot more to improve on what they've already done. I'm, no one here today is going to uh, say that industry needs to stop what they're doing. And the question here is about how you make progress. And to me, that progress really comes down to technological uh, em empowerment and improvement of, um, of ways that we have of, of punishing when companies lie or when companies uh, allow data to be abused. And I would just close by saying that I, I am a little uncomfortable when um, we, the conversation focuses on commercial uses of data. Because it's true those uses are enormously beneficial and that they really do drive our economy. And the economic consequences of, of mucking with that, uh, the golden goose here, are significant. And it's not just in the internet, it's also in the credit system and in the rest of the economy that depends on information. But I do want to point out here that we're talking about many non-commercial uses of data as well. Right. So something like flu trends is not a business. It is simply a way of benefiting society. And there I would point out that the Supreme Court has not been silent here. The recent decision in the Sorrell case very clearly holds, contrary to what some of the uh, privacy, um, what, I, what people I would consider that, that look at privacy as the only value to be uh, maximized here, they argued essentially that data is not speech, that it is a raw commodity that is not protected by the First Amendment, and the Supreme Court very clearly held otherwise. And they did so in recognition of the fact that even when, for example, we're talking about the uh, study of prescription records and how pharmacists and doctors uh, prescribe drugs, there are enormously beneficial uh, non-commercial uses of that data. And those things are protected by the First Amendment. So the argument that I made at the beginning of this remark to say that government should have to identify a compelling uh, need for regulation, which means a real harm, and to say that there's a narrowly tailored solution and that there are no less restrictive alternatives that could do the job, that's not just a policy argument. I think ultimately we're going to see the Supreme Court insist that that is going to be the standard in, in many of these cases. Because when you regulate, for example, advertising, you're burdening not just Procter & Gamble with its toothpaste ads, but also political advertising, and advertising for churches and nonprofits. And it's, to me, it's fundamentally important that we not leave those things out and recognize that among the values here are not only jobs and efficiency and innovation, but also free speech and basically communication in, in information society. Thank you for that. And let's uh, kind of pick up on that last comment. And Howard, I want to come to you. Uh, as you look at all the uses of data, and this is a conversation I had last weekend with some of my uh, health informatics innovators that are constituents of mine. They're looking at the way the different disciplines, whether it is something like flu trends or it is other analysis that will come from data or innovations of ways to use that data, attachments to broadband on mobile devices that people will take with them uh, in, in health care. Um, they are looking at how different agencies uh, come to play in this. So 
as we look at this, should we, let's, let's talk about two different things. Should we encourage the FCC to back out of this and focus primarily on the FTC as we look at uh, having the industry develop their own self-regulation, uh, their own best practices? Uh, should we encourage the FTC to give the industry more time to develop what those protocols and those guidelines are going to be and building on uh, the success that has been there in, in the past and kind of uh, paraphrasing what Larry had to say, if it's not broken, then don't try to fix this. So Howard, first to you and then Randy, I want to come to you. I, I think the, um, uh, the the FTC is at its best when it um, uh, essentially tries to develop and enforce common law principles, uh, and and that's really where the information security cases uh, at the FTC came from, uh, was the recognition that there was that there was a harm here that needed to be addressed, that companies weren't taking appropriate <coughs> care of sensitive information, and that that was something where the FTC Act uh, could be used. Uh, it, 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 I mean, we thought then, I think now, it would be a mistake to try to regulate that practice in detail. And what I see in the FTC report, um, you know, the framework document is not a framework, but, you know, it's all the questions you'd have to answer if you wanted to write a detailed rule uh, uh, about who can do what with, uh, uh, with information. Uh, I, I think that would be a terrible approach for all the reasons that, uh, uh, that, 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 we've been, uh, that we've been talking about. I think there is a role for multiple agencies. I mean, some of the communications uh, issues and the sensitivity of uh, uh, and, and the, the, the telecommunications specific information. I mean, it makes sense for the FCC to be involved in those. Uh, but I think it also makes sense for the FTC to um, watch this process develop and deal with clear and identified problems that, are, that emerge uh, in this, as, as this process develops. Um, rather than trying to anticipate um, and speculate about things that could go wrong, uh, it, because you just create tremendous difficulties uh, uh, along the way and prevent a lot of very real benefits. Kind of like net neutrality? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> trying to legislate for a problem that doesn't exist, Larry. Uh, Randy. Uh, thank you. I, I was going to bring up net neutrality if you didn't, so that was, <laughs> thank you for that. <clears throat> well, I've, I've been uh, uh, doing FCC law and policy for about 30 years now, sad to say, and, and so I'm, I might say, I mean, it's only sad to say that I'm that old, but <laughs> the, you know, I might begin by saying only half facetiously that any time we can think seriously about getting the FCC out of the particular area of regulation, that that's a good thing. I would, I would start with that proposition as a, a general proposition, and I, I think it's relevant here. And I'm, I guess I have a little, a slightly different take than Howard, if I understood him correctly, because, well, the FCC's two principal uh, provisions that regulate privacy, I think in the sense that we're mostly talking about it today, are are uh, Section 222 and Section 631 uh, of the Communications Act. I won't get dorky any, anymore, but those, those provisions deal with the uh, collection and possession of subscriber information by telephone companies, right, on the one hand, and cable companies on the other hand. And they have to do with how the, the collectors of, of that information, these uh, communications companies, uh, hold it, uh, what what uh, rights they have to it, and what notice subscribers get. If, if you look at those provisions, and and so they're it's they're generally when you look at them, they have a lot of the same types of characteristics that we talk about when we look at, at what a privacy regime ought to look like more generally. I think so. I my view is that it, the, it would be appropriate, I think, if, if, and, and even desirable, to, to eliminate uh, that part of the FCC's duties. It's, you know, uh, it's got other things that it could focus on and, and, 
and that we don't need this dual jurisdictional regime. And, and here are the main reasons. I mean, number one, you know, it's a time when we're all focused on government efficiency, and there's some overlap. It's not complete, and there's there's some there's always some differences in in sectors of the marketplace that that agencies develop some expertise and have some people. But in general, there's there's uh, I think a, a dual jurisdiction. Uh, more fundamentally, I think in the digital IP world that we now live in, or that we're rapidly <laughs> all living in, the, the distinctions, these regulatory distinctions upon which the FCC's own privacy regimes were established are breaking down. In other words, the definitions between, you know, telecommunications, uh, cable operators, uh, and so forth are, even though they're still in the Communications Act, I think they're really uh, recognized as increasingly obsolete. So that leads to the proposition that in the world that we live in today, uh, it doesn't make sense to try and distinguish among the various providers and collectors of information for regulatory purposes uh, in this IP world, uh, and that if you do so, you're doing so at the sacrifice probably of some consistency in terms of regulation. Now, of course, everything I'm saying uh, uh, is premised upon, I'm putting aside the question of whether there should be regulation and how much, but, but you're sacrificing consistency uh, of enforcement and probably some uh, efficiency. And then finally, I would just say on top of that, and I think Howard alluded to this, uh, if not directly, at least implicitly, the F, if you just look at these two institutions, the uh, FTC and the FCC, I think you could say, without doing any real damage to the truth, that on the one hand, the FTC has a record of, of generally operating and regulating on a more fact-based, uh, market-driven, economically sound basis uh, than the FCC, which on the other hand, whether because of its amorphous public interest ju jurisdiction or, or whether just a long history of, of uh, regulating through rulemaking and trying to anticipate in rulemaking all potential harms, it tends, I think, when it does regulate, to by uh, conjuring up those harms to, to take a, a broader view. So, so I'm pretty comfortable with, and I would urge you to take a good look at, at, at getting rid of the FCC's jur jurisdiction over, uh, you know, privacy, and particularly the subscriber privacy regulation, and, and looking at the FTC as a home for that. Can, can I? Can I uh, yeah, Larry. Uh, let me gonna, go to Tom. Yeah, I just brief. I mean, I think if you look at this in the in the broader context. Numerous proposals over the last couple of years about treating the communications companies more like other companies and and making the the competition agencies responsible for competition policy rather than the FCC. Moving privacy to to the FTC and out of the FCC would be one perhaps relatively small step in that direction. Okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to put a punctuation mark on something that, that Randy said, uh, and I want to remind you that in the FCC's open internet order, in the net neutrality order, the agency sort of explicitly rejected the idea that it liked to measure harms based on recognized antitrust concerns about, you know, cognizable harms to consumer. They said in paragraph 58, was it the famous, they said, you know, we want to take a much more flexible approach to how we enforce the net neutrality rules and, and look at them, you know, without regard to existing standards. I think that set a very, very dangerous precedent and suggests, as Randy has said, the FCC is not the agency uh, to, uh, to, to look into privacy in, in any more detail than, than we can. Uh, just two quick points, if I may. I agree that we'd be better off with a one-stop shop regulator, and I think that anybody who's serious about privacy would think so as well. I suspect that some of the consumer, um, so-called consumer advocacy groups that have been uh, skeptical about that 
are in fact not doing it because they think that we wouldn't be better off in terms of privacy enforcement, but because they like the idea of forum shopping and being able to engage in political theater here. Because to be you know, quite frank, unfortunately, a lot of this conversation really revolves not around law or the Constitution or any sort of legal standard, but around uh, letters, uh, angry letters from congressmen, which are sometimes justified and sometimes appropriate, and other times really are just being done for publicity. And unfortunately, this is one of the problems with having uh, split jurisdiction, is you basically allow gaming of the system. Um, so I think we'd all be better off with less political theater and, an, and an, a single agency that is serious about enforcement. And there, are, we could talk about this more later, there are a lot of enforcement actions I would like to see the FTC bring. And if they don't have the resources to do it, by all means, let's give, give those resources to them. But the second point I would make is that Randy's exactly right and Tom's right that the, the, the legal standard that the FTC has is the correct one, which is grounded ultimately in consumer welfare and in clear uh, principles of unfair and, de uh, and deceptive trade practices. I would say, once again, unfortunately, though, that this particular leadership at the FTC, I, I don't think has done justice to those principles. And that's not a reason to say that the FTC isn't the right place to regulate privacy. It simply means that we need to have at the FTC a leadership that is very clearly based, exactly as, uh, as Randy and Tom were saying, on economic and rigorous analysis. And I'm sorry to say here that that really has not happened. I think we very little understand what exactly the consequences of regulation would be. And it seems to be because this particular uh, agency, this particular FTC, has simply been less interested in spending the time uh, to, that, that previous uh, administrations have, such as when and Howard was there, doing economic research on the consequences of regulation. So if you remember one thing today from my comments, it's that we really don't know uh, what precipice we're about to leap off of. And as you'll hear tomorrow at the uh, hearing that your subcommittee is, uh, is doing, uh, Europe has been down this road. But we don't even know how, quite how bad things are going to be if we were to take a European approach here, because the Europeans don't really enforce the laws that they have on the books. In other words, their enforcement regime is mushy. They basically uh, smooth out the, the, the wrinkles because everyone goes in and they make nice at the data protection authorities. Whereas in this country, we have a tradition of actually enforcing laws, which is a good thing, and I think we should all be uh, applauding. But it means that when we write laws here, we have to be very serious and careful about ensuring that, the, that when the laws are actually enforced as written, we understand their consequences. In other words, the experience of Europe doesn't tell us how disastrous European-style regulation could be here, especially since all the companies we're talking about come from this country. They are our competitive edge, and they're, com they're companies that, at the end of the day, for both commercial and non-commercial purposes, would, I think, suffer terribly from European-style regulation. Okay. Uh, Congressman, just very quickly. Um, there are far more than two agencies in Washington that regulate privacy. Uh, there, there are dozens. And probably the biggest area of privacy regulation is with health care. Um, and the, it, it's not a question just of dual jurisdiction. It's practically every agency in Washington has substantial privacy regulation, whether it's financial records, educational records, uh, Defense Department records. Uh, it's it's just uh, an amazing, uh, complex system. I'm not certain that going to a single, single regulator really is, is the right outcome, but uh, some, some form of consistency uh, might, might ultimately have some benefit. Okay. Sure. Daniel, jump in. <coughs> Just kind of building off on what was already said, um, you know, I, I do think when we look at this issue, too much regulation is just as much a risk uh, for data as too little regulation. Um, as Harold, I think, mentioned earlier, government regulation is traditionally seen as much more rigid uh, versus self-regulation where you have a lot more uh, flexibility and opportunity to change with technology and, and new economic models and new business practices. I think uh, one criticism, uh, of course, everyone says uh, self-regulation isn't perfect. You know, Baron already mentioned that before. We, we always see problems with it. But if you look, uh, for example, specifically at online behavioral advertising, uh, one area where you've seen a lot of advancement over the last six months to one year, you've seen a lot of change. All of this change is, of course, in response to um, both industry concerns and external pressure. Um, government concerns, public interest concerns. That's exactly what you want to see in a self-regulatory regime. That's a healthy self-regulatory regime. Uh, you know, industry being responsive um, to, to other uh, needs outside of industry. Um, so, you know, if you get to the um, question of, well, if not regulation or strict government regulation, then what can you do? 
right? One, one very strong area is, of course, enforcement. Um, but the second one is how can you uh, incentivize more economic use of data, uh, right? So one of the um, you know, differences that you see in, in coming out of some of these um, government reports lately on privacy is the idea that we need more privacy um, offices. You know, as Jim mentioned, it's not just one government agency that's doing this. Uh, so even the Department of Commerce is proposing a, a data privacy office, right? Uh, and of course, it's the Department of Commerce. The idea is to incentivize more commerce. As we've talked about, there's so many economic opportunities here. Uh, the McKinsey Global Institute put out a report on big data recently, putting some numbers to this. Um, you know, $300 billion uh, opportunity for uh, personal health information, a $600 billion opportunity for personal location data. Of course, we know online advertising is $26 billion a year just in the United States, and it funds, of course, much larger internet. So the question is, if, if you have the Department of Commerce thinking about data privacy instead of, for example, uh, maybe having a data policy office, where the idea is how do we get more data into the information economy and get it so it's used responsibly? You know, that's kind of the right framework. And then you can start talking about things that the government can do that's not regulation that can be beneficial and still protect consumers. For example, how do you anonymize data correctly? How do you have cross-border data flow? How do you uh, protect consumers with enforcement of existing regulations? And these are the kinds of um, policies and principles I think uh, government, especially when you talk about the Department of Commerce, should be uh, focusing on how they should be approaching the problem. Uh, good morning. Uh, Tom, Tom Sidner with the... Um uh, Association for Competitive Technology. Uh, I actually am uh, their uh, intellectual property fellow. I work mostly in the uh, um, 501c3 think tank, Innovators Network. Um, but uh, today I'm here actually uh, in sort of with my uh, ACT hat on to talk about uh, privacy implications uh, and, 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 and what do we do about this moving forward. I mean, ACT's interest in this, ACT is a, is a trade association, represents small and medium uh, sized software developers. Turns out to be a great time to be in that. Um, space because there has been an absolute renaissance of uh, small and medium-sized software developed shops cropping up all over the United States, um, creating jobs, and a lot of it has to do with these. Uh, a lot of our um, members are app developers working on mobile platforms, and so the issue, the, the, the brand new set of issues that arise out of uh, location data uh, are extremely important to them both in, in terms of, of planning, you know, great new services that consumers will really like, and also figuring out exactly how do we, you know, clearly privacy is, it may, and, it may, and uh, protecting people's reasonable expectations is going to be an important part of, of making that system work. And um, so we've actually been deeply involved in uh, the, um, the recent debates about uh, location information and privacy. Um, our uh, President Jonathan Zook and uh, Executive Director Morgan Reed both testified uh, before congressional hearings uh, this year. And, um, you know, so what are perspective do we bring uh, to, the, to the debate? I think it's a couple. Number one, let me begin by strongly agreeing and amplifying, I think, with something Barron said, and, and that's that this privacy debate, a big part of it has got to be um, updating the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. That was a great example of American leadership at an early stage we really need to reassert that leadership again and understand it for what it is. It, it directly relates not just to uh, civil rights in America, but uh, to American competitiveness abroad. And talking with some of the larger folks who are working with developing, uh, you know, cloud platforms, we're seeing discrimination against those American platforms in Europe. The argument being not that our general privacy laws are, are inadequate, but that there's not. We don't. Our law does not make it clear when the government when the U.S. government can get access to electronic data. Uh, that's being used against us. On the other side, we also need to make sure we're still setting a good example of, of providing protection because we really do, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling to bring some of our other trading partners like, say, China, into the realm of basic rule of law and, and basic respect for private civil rights that we, we may not be seeing today. So, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with that, and I, I think it ought to, be, ought to be understood not just as a civil rights issue, but also it's, a, it's a, going to be a trade issue um, for us. The uh, other thing that I think has been said several times that can't be stressed uh, enough, um, we're working right now developing uh, with app application developers to uh, develop a set of industry best practices relating to privacy. Um, 
providing for small and medium-sized businesses is a, a, a toolkit for designing your privacy policy, talking, you know, in, informing consumers about, you know, what you, um, wh what you're, what data you're going to collect, what data you're not going to collect, uh, how, you, what you'll do when you make changes to it, all very important. Um, but one of the key, the key things to keep in mind in this debate is that. A lot of the, abuse, the abuses people are concerned about, the problem is not that they are not violations of laws that already exist. Uh, and we have 51 consumer protection acts in this country, and most of them provide very powerful enforcement authority. Um, we can enforce existing law and solve most of these problems. That's got to be an incredibly important part of it uh, because those laws are flexible. They do, they, will, they, do, they do allow enforcement agencies to adapt to circumstances, and that means that they would also allow businesses to adapt their business models um, as, as time and technology change. That's really got to be a very important part of the whole puzzle. Um, and obviously, the, one of the challenges is, well, how do you, um, do we have enough re, you know, enforcement resources? Are they well-trained enough? And, and how do you deploy them effectively? And I think w there, are, you, you, there are indeed ways to deploy them effectively. I mean, essentially, one thing you can do is look at the top and the bottom of the Internet food chain. Uh, at the bottom, you have uh, entities that are running business models that are based almost entirely on illegal activity. Um, you want to talk about groups, that are, uh, entities that have absolutely no respect whatsoever for privacy, um, that would be them. Um, I did a, a, a great deal of research on, uh, what, on, on various shenanigans pulled by distributors of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing programs that were almost never used for lawful purposes, and the privacy consequences are simply horrific. We're talking about multiple breaches of national, military, corporate, uh, personal data security on a vast scale, conduct that was done very deliberately with the purpose of tricking people into sharing files that they didn't intend to share. Um, we're seeing similar behavior beginning to show up again, just some new computer science research that came out about uh, online one-click hosting sites uh, that turn out to be a lot less secure than you might think. They're not really lockers, they're distribution platforms. Um, gee, what a surprise. So, I mean, if you look there, we, I mean, there, we're going to find, you know, that is a good place to look for the bad actors. At the other end, you know, we all, you know, it's the internet, they're going to be, mar they're going to be network effects, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a result we should uh, uh, seek to necessarily prevent or, or could if we tried. Um, but, you know, we do need the market leaders to lead uh, and to lead responsibly. Um, and, you know, that's we, one of the things that we were stressing, the, the importance of self-regulation and that industry, this is an area where industry understands they've got to be responsible. That consumers are going to demand it and, 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 and that we, we can rely on self-regulation. We need some help in, in, in proving that point. I mean, we just had a, everybody who's concerned about these issues, this is the non-prosecution agreement uh, reached between the U.S. Department of Justice and um, Google relating to their uh, promotion of online, illegal online pharmacies. Uh, it's important to read this document. It is an incredibly disappointing um, uh, piece of paper. Um, we need leadership there. Uh, we need a good example set for everybody. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that the, as we move forward, we really have a lot of the tools in place to have a, a, um, a, a, a to use our existing law and leverage it to good result. We, we need just we need some help from the enforcement agencies at both the state and federal level. Uh, just briefly, couldn't agree more on the uh, need for greater enforcement. I suspect that if the Congress told the FTC it was to, to use the authority it had, and if it needs more resources to ask for them specifically, you would see the agency switch to the time and effort that it's spending right now lobbying for more power and starting to use its existing authority. And I mean that very, very seriously. I also want to again reiterate that there are things we can do on that layered approach to make those privacy torts work better. Just as a hypothetical, what if, for example, we had a federal law, and I, I don't particularly care for, for the trial uh, law, law, lawyer bar myself either, but what if we had a federal law that simply said if you bring a privacy suit, which are right now very expensive and very difficult to maintain, you can win attorney's fees. That right there, that sort of thing could dramatically empower consumers who really have been wrong. That's the kind of layered approach I'm talking about. On uh, Daniel's point about self-regulation, I just want to reiterate that when I talk about this, I want to make clear that self-regulation is not 
primarily what I'm relying on, it's market regulation. And market regulation means all the forces in the marketplace that make companies self-regulate. They're not just doing it for fear of, of being uh, slammed down by the government. They're doing it because their number one asset in this economy is their reputation, and they want to protect it. Uh, on, on Tom's point, very briefly, uh, digital due process is the Coalition for ECPA reform. I invite all of you to check it out. Uh, the, the, the lack of protection for mobile data is the number one threat both to privacy in the mobile space and also to commerce and the development of all those, those companies that are creating jobs, just as Tom mentioned. And then finally, on the point about market leaders uh, leading, well, I think you have seen uh, a lot of good news here from companies like Yahoo and Google and Facebook and Microsoft, all of whom have done uh, yeoman's work in empowering users to choose and in seeing the data that is uh, available about them. And I think uh, what we need to do is look a lot more carefully to see when consumers are actually given those tools and those choices, what do they actually choose? And I think you'll see, and there's going to be, I understand, a hearing um, coming out on this in October, again, from your subcommittee, that the consumer expectations here actually demonstrate that most people, in fact, just want to know. And when they have the tools to know, they're actually pretty comfortable with the data collection that's going on about them. And indeed, when they make choices, it's often not to opt out but to improve the profile that somebody has on them to get even more relevant advertising. So I just want to make sure that everyone realizes that there is a good news story here. The good news is empowerment, and that's uh, one of those E-words that I want to leave you with today. Empowerment, enforcement of existing laws, education, and erecting higher barriers against government access. Thank you for that. And let's, let's look at that transparency and the interface with the consumer for a few minutes because that is one of the areas that we as policymakers hear from our constituents on when they feel as if data is being used in a manner that they didn't know that it was being used. And that surprise element comes as an unwelcome uh, recognition by so many of our consumers. Uh, every time I get a, a notice of uh, a privacy change, I send it to Josh so that we have it kind of in our treasure trove of what individuals are, are doing. But uh, Daniel, I want to come back to you on this and have you weigh in for a minute. What, um, as we know, consumers' confidence is at a tipping point when it comes to the issue of privacy and data. And they're looking for a little bit of certainty. They want to know. Uh, they don't like the unexpected and the unknowing. What is the guidance that uh, you would have for industry or that you all would look at as far as uh, being transparent to the consumers, making them fully aware? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I think there's a, a lot that is starting to be done in this area. Um, that should be continued. Uh, industry certainly needs to do a better job of educating users about how their data is being collected, how it's being used, and what their choices are. And I think we're seeing some of that. Um, of course, we've had the um, ad notice icon, ad choice icon come out, and uh, that's just now being rolled out fully to um, online, online advertisers, but also um, publishers. You have uh, pretty much everyone in the internet on online advertising ecosystem even involved in this process. Um, I think when you start looking at kind of this broader issue of, of privacy and data, uh, for example, with mobile apps, um, you realize it's very difficult to communicate all this information that consumers want to know um, in a very easy to use form. Um, if I, you know, have my phone and I want to download an app, there's not a really easy way to let me know um, everything that the app might be doing with my data, um, how it might be used for advertising, how it might be collected for um, improving the app what kind of services might be involved on the back end. Um, and and that's, a, that's a problem for consumers, but I don't think most consumers actually want to know all that information. They just want to know that nothing bad is going to happen to them. Um, so I think one solution in this space is really that you're going to have, one, uh, the emergence of very responsible companies um, that are going to see this as a market opportunity. And they're going to say, you know, if, for example, Google might say, we are going to police the Android uh, market platform, and, and you're going to know if you get an app from us, it's secure or Apple's going to do something similar. Or you're going to have um, third party um, uh, independent, independently verifying these kinds of apps. Uh, you could have Trusty, for example, um, you know, do certification. And they are starting to do things like that. And I think that's really what consumers want. They want to have this uh, you know, Better Business Bureau kind of seal of approval on things that they do so that they can know, you know what, somebody has taken the time 
to go into depth and look at, the, look at this, and I can trust that. And it could be some of that's government. It could be, um, you know, government regulators have more of an opportunity to go in and, and look and make sure things are okay and, and sign off and improve things. Uh, but a lot of that can be done uh, from the private sector. Great. Randy? Well, uh, we all get all those notices that you pass on to, <laughs> to Josh, and I'm glad you are the repository of them if we it need is. to look at them. But, I mean, it, I mean, it just strikes me, and, uh, you know, without doing, having done any empirical studies on this, but, I mean, it's an area when you, again, when you think about regulation in this sense, that it, it, it's a case where less it would probably accomplish more. I mean, one reason why the notices that we get, you know, are so long. It's not maybe the only, only reason, but one reason is because of what the regulators require to be put into the notices, right, or what, what Congress might, might require, uh, obviously some of which is not as important to consumers as, as other, other information. So when you're approaching this issue of transparency and notice, you know, I think it's good to uh, have in mind that principle that sometimes less will accomplish more. I think in the net, you mentioned the net neutrality proceeding earlier, and, and you know, part of uh, the FCC's rules deal with the transparency and notice issue, and, you know, without citing the paragraph as, as adeptly as, as Larry did earlier of the order, I think that, you know, that was a case where the FCC's you know, requirements for the notice, uh, you know, without going into all the details here, probably was more uh, uh, complete, shall we say, to be not, you know, than it, than it should have been to accomplish what it needed to, to do there. Congressman, this is really kind of an important point. So uh, our folks that we tend to disagree with would uh, agree with the sentiment that notice has failed, but they would take a very different approach. They would basically say that because the notice and choice model has failed that the U.S. has tried over the last uh, uh, 15 or so years, that we should instead move to sweeping uh, regulation that governs how data is used. And to some extent, I would agree that we should govern how data is used when, as Howard said, there is a real reason to believe that data harm would follow from it. But I think it's very important that we not give up on notice in, in two senses. One is the sense in which, um, as distinct from the government-mandated notices, such as under Graham Leach Bliley for credit and financial data that are pushed out to us in the mail that nobody reads, distinct from that, there is a, a very different sort of notice, which is when I want to know what's going on, I, I can see it. I can click on an icon. It's exactly what Daniel was talking about. Or I can go to many of the transparency tools that I mentioned earlier that are available from big companies as well as small companies like Blue Kai. That's a very important form of notice. It's a different kind of transparency. And that's something that I think, that, again, there's a good news story on. Market forces are causing companies to do that. But there's a third and critically important form of transparency, which is that companies need to, in my opinion, disclose clearly uh, to the enforcement agencies, m most of all the FTC, what they're doing. Because part of the problem today is that the FTC, to the extent that it hasn't brought the kinds of enforcement actions that I would like to see it bring, is that it, there aren't great ways today of making that um, communication to the agency about what a company is doing robust. And I think the answer for that is technological. This is certainly something that Commissioner Rush is talking about. At Tom Leonard's Aspen Summit, Commissioner Rush uh, basically suggested that this is where the FTC should, should emphasize its enforcement. It should uh, have companies disclose more clearly, more granularly, what their data practices are, and then hold them to those. That, that could certainly go awry if the FTC were to be unduly constraining in how it uh, required companies to disclose what their practices are. But in principle, I want to stand here today and say that companies should be held to account for what they say they're going to do, and they shouldn't be able to describe what they're doing in such vague terms that the FTC's enforcement powers aren't meaningful. So that's, when we talk about enforcement, it's a two-way street. It's both from the agency, having the resources and the time and the focus and prioritization on enforcement, and also on companies that are disclosing clearly what they're doing and being held to account. Jim. I think uh, this is important to talk about uh, going forward, how do we get consumers in a better position than they're in now? Daniel, Daniel I think, summarizes the problem well. Uh, most consumers don't want to study what's going on. They just want it to work, and they want to make sure nothing bad is going to happen. So notice is sort of a, a decade or, or a decade long or longer experiment that everybody agreed upon. I mean, I mean, the major websites adopted privacy policies on their own essentially because of, because of market forces, because we all believed that notice was an important thing to have. Turns out we were doing that for ourselves. That is, privacy people were 
doing stuff that they were interested in and not actually reaching consumers. So we've got to be thinking about consumers and how they think. And I think I'll, I'll cite uh, Dana Boyd, with, who's an ethnographer with Microsoft that studies how people behave with relation to technology. So a, a, a small example is, is people on Facebook, for example, will, will share information in such a way that only a small group of others can recognize what it's about because they're already uh, aware of information. Uh, people should, uh, people's ability to create alternate personas when they're online should be preserved. People's ability to, to use devices that mask IP address in order to uh, communicate controversial views, those should be preserved. Those are all privacy protective. And by, by protecting people's ability to use tools, uh, they'll be in a better position. I think it'll take a long time for today's generation, maybe the one behind it, to grow up understanding innately how this stuff works, what to do and what not to do. Um, that's going to be the privacy protection is waiting for it to come rather than top-down forcing information into people's brains because it just doesn't get there, which is it's too bad, but it just doesn't get there with these notice, notice programs. It just I wanted to, to mention on the, 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 the privacy policies, there's, a, there's an interesting study that was done out of Carnegie Mellon on what, what, it would, what costs it would be involved for consumers if they actually read privacy policies. And the number they came up with was $780 billion uh, for the opportunity cost uh, of the time that you would spend reading privacy policies. I mean, the, the order of magnitude is just completely wrong. Uh, uh, for, for what's at stake. And triple it when it comes to understanding the privacy policies after the reading. Counts, Absolutely. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Just reading it is a, is a, would be a huge undertaking. Uh, and I'm, I agree completely with Dan. I think what consumers want is some assurance here that this is going to work. It's not going to do something bad. Uh, and that there, and there needs to be a mechanism to impose consequences on people who violate that understanding. Uh, but that's, it's got to be focused on the consequences. It can't be you didn't tell me about this um, <clears throat> because there's not a practical way to, to, to tell you about it that's, that's worth the time and effort that it takes. Okay. Let's kind of do a – Tom, did you have something uh, to add? Yeah. Go ahead. Because, uh, it's really, I think what everybody else is saying and kind of implicitly, the way data is used is very complicated for all sorts of purposes. So to exp and so a lot of transparency sounds good. I mean – to really understand it takes, I mean, it's, it's just very complicated for, you know, what data brokers do for authentication, what people do to prevent fraud, what search, how search engines use data to improve their search engine, uh, how marketers use it. It's all very, very complicated. So it's, uh, you know, I mean, as my co-author, uh, Paul Rubin, has sometimes wanted to say, I don't understand how my car works, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as we come to the end of our time, what I'd like to do is more or less a lightning round uh, as we look at data protection, as we look at data use, as policymakers consider uh, privacy and the issue of privacy or allowing an individual, as I like to say, to protect their virtual you online. Uh, what would be your guidance other than go very slowly which uh, I and thoughtfully which I think all of you have expressed in one form today. Uh, Howard I'm going to start with you. Let's work our way all the way around ending with Larry and just give me your 30 seconds of what your advice to policy makers would be as we look at the data protection issue. Well I think I, I, I think first and foremost Focus on the consequences that you're really concerned about, and think about ways to try to control uh, to control those consequences uh, that 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 are focused on those consequences and that don't have uh, broader implications. Uh, stay away from uh, prescriptive uh, general principles about how information can be used, because people are going to think of ways to to use information that will have benefits that haven't occurred to anybody yet. Uh, and general principles are, are, are likely to impair uh, a lot of that, uh, uh, that, a lot of that kind of innovation and a lot of that kind of uh, uh, information usage. Uh, if, if, there's, if there's problems like governmental access or particular uses of data that people are worried about, then by all means uh, offer some protection against those particular uses, uh, but, but that's, really, that's really what the focus ought to be. 
I, I'll just share two bits of wisdom. Uh, first, uh, Hayek uh, always said that the task of economics was to demonstrate to men how little they understand about what they imagine they can design. And I think the FTC and Congress both would do well to heed Hayek's words and think a little more carefully about the consequences of what we're doing. Second, I just discovered last night by coincidence, uh, reading one of my favorite uh, Greek poets, uh, writing about, uh, you'll, you'll see where this is going, about a Greek colony in 400 BC that decided that things were going wrong and they needed to bring in a reform politician and all the problems about uh, that politicians create. And it ends with the line, why be in such a rush? Haste can be such a dangerous thing. Premature measures always bring regrets. It's true and regrettable the colony has many flaws, but what work of humankind is without blemish? After all, we're making some progress. And the two lessons I take from that are one, uh, let's not rush here. This is not about getting something done in this Congress. This is about doing privacy right. And that means, in my mind, figuring out the ways to make improvements uh, in a layered approach, step by step, and figure out ways to protect consumers better. And second of all, uh, looking at the good news story. We are making progress here. That progress is coming primarily from the private sector and from market forces. And it's progress in technology. It's progress in uh, user empowerment and transparency and self-regulation. And I, again, would just caution that we are, we are leaping and know not where we leap. And that, to me, is very dangerous, since we are ultimately talking about the engine that drives not only the internet, but also the rest of our information economy. Uh, the, uh, general thoughts would be, uh, just quickly, uh, number one, again, I think others would agree with this. We need to preserve flexibility, because at the end of the day, number one, we don't know how the business models are going to change in response to consumer preferences. Um, that is critical. People have very, very widely differing views on issues like privacy. Flexible regimes will preserve that right of individual choice, whereas when you become too prescriptive, you're essentially telling people uh, what they, what they, assuming that you know what people should want and will want in the future, and, and, and we don't. Um, and second, we, we, have good, we have laws in the book that are capable of dealing with most of these situations. We need to enforce them. We need to target the bottom, where we've got people engaging in, in mostly illegal business models that simply punish those who try to act within the law, uh, and, and we need some leadership at the top. Yeah, well, I agree with everything. I could, just one or two other things. There was an interesting fact that Hal Varian uh, uh, mentioned at, at the privacy panel at, at our Aspen conference that I was surprised. Uh, there are, were 135 privacy complaints per year at the FTC. I'm not sure over what period, but I guess it's over several years, a study done by some Berkeley students. Twelve of those, on average, were about marketing practices. Those are remarkably low numbers. Actually, half of them were about some company that aggregates basically public, public record data. Um, so, you know, that, th those are just remarkably low numbers. And picking up on something that Tom just said, I, it, it does seem, um, it does seem like many of the problems are just are, are bad actors at the bottom of the food chain uh, who don't care about their reputations, probably wouldn't care about new FTC regulations. So to put in a new regulatory regime that would constrain companies that really do care about their reputations and are going to follow them in order when the problem is these, these, these bad actors at the bottom of the barrel is You've got to find some, some way of getting, of getting to them. I'm not sure exactly how it is. Maybe it's criminal penalties, which nobody's really talking about. But uh. Well, uh, I may hear it closer to the lightning round rules, potentially. But when I was reading my favorite Greek poet last night, uh, I, I didn't find anything relevant to privacy. But uh, this, is, this has been a... Thank you again for this session, Cong Congressman. This has been great. Uh, so w w here's what I would say uh, quickly, that you haven't heard anyone here today among this group of uh, generally free market-oriented um, think tankers argue that there shouldn't be any law or regulation in this space. Uh, no, I don't think anyone's taken that uh, position at all, and it's important to, to say that. But. Uh, I think what, you know, I would say at the end is that because of all the, because of the benefits that we've talked about that can be derived from data, it's important to always have, have those in, in mind. And because of the complications in devising a regulatory regime that's not 
overextended in which the costs exceed the benefits, I think, you know, a sort of fundamental principle is that, and particularly because we're dealing with uh, an evolving marketplace in this internet ecosystem with a lot of players, the default position, the default principle should be, you know, let the marketplace work and, and deal with the situation uh, if it can, because I think we've heard that in a lot of instances it likely will. Thank you. Daniel. I would just say that, you know, echoing again what we said earlier, I think the, the focus of um, policymakers should be to focus on specific privacy harms and not try to regulate um, business practices. Uh, the, the goal should be to protect consumers, and you do this by promoting competition, choice, and innovation um, in the economy broadly and with technology. And um, you know, the other the other key idea here is policymakers need to make sure that we are actually keeping information in the information economy. In many ways, government doesn't need to give us privacy, it needs to allow for us to have privacy in the first place, which means in many ways, not just ECPO reform, but avoiding policies like mandatory back doors into our communications and requirements that companies retain information that they wouldn't otherwise. That's a one key aspect of this. The other aspect is humility and recognition of how quickly consumers' expectations are changing. What today seems icky or perhaps even illegal may well be something that people enjoy in the future. Facebook's newsfeed uh, wasn't popular when it started, but it's now something that many people enjoy, and that's just one of many examples. If we're going to focus on enforcement and regulatory agencies, there needs to be very narrow authority. In many ways, the regulatory agency, the FTC today, has fairly broad authority, and as we've seen for many decades, depending on who's in charge, that authority can be used in devastating uh, ways for commerce, which is why if government is going to legislate on this space and devote more resources to enforcement, it needs to be a very narrow and focused approach. Harold. Congressman, I would just use your good Tennessee common sense. I would listen to folks from back home, hear their concerns, be vigilant. Uh, this problem isn't going to go away, but I don't think, as you've heard today, I don't think there's a simple solution. You said don't tell you just to go slow, so I would say be vigilant, keep watching, and when things get really out of control, then maybe it's time to step in. I'm not sure we're there yet. Jim? Well, you've put together a good panel. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Um, and a lot of important ideas have been shared. I may have one that we didn't touch on, but maybe came close to, and Ryan came close to, certainly the talk of ECPA reform. Um, but all the agencies that regulate privacy practices, many of them are also holders of a lot of personal information about Americans. And so we could certainly talk about if there is going to be privacy law reform, uh, let's reform privacy practices in the federal government. The Department of Defense, Health and Human Services, Veterans Administration has an amazing quantity and quality of data about people, including on down to psychologist notes, psychiatrist notes, Internal Revenue Service, Social Security Administration, financial information, and the Department of Homeland Security, which collects information about people on their, based on their travels and, and entry and exit to the country. All these agencies are, are holders of an incredible amount of data about Americans, and perhaps we should focus on their privacy practices. Um, the federal government could lead on this and, and uh, teach markets a lesson, if it can. Um, so that's, a, that's another w uh, thing to think about in this area. Thanks very much again. Sure. Okay. Thank you for giving me the, the, the last uh, 30 seconds. Um, two legislative solutions that would be wonderful. One, uh, let's get the FCC completely out of the business of regulating privacy in any sense, given their, their proclivities. Two, uh, I would also like to see the states preempted from uh, issuing another 50 sets of fi privacy regulations. Uh, we haven't mentioned that before, but I think state preemption would be a pretty appropriate, uh, again, given the sort of changing nature of, of how user expectations are changing and how information is being used. Uh, I think that was actually the most effective feature of the CAN SPAM Act was that it preempted state law that would have done even more damage uh, than CAN SPAM itself. Um, third, just to focus the uh, enforcement on 
cognizable consumer harms, as we've said repeatedly. And then fourth, uh, you know, uh, and I think, you know, you particular, Congressman, can continue your leadership in encouraging uh, industry and all information users, including government users, to listen to their users, to listen to consumers, and change their practices when it appears that consumers are not happy with them. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much. I, uh, <clears throat> I, I like the, uh, the thoughts that have come from several of you um, focusing on data maintenance and data protection and looking, Daniel, as you said, at data policy uh, and assessing first what all of the different arenas are that the federal government touches the privacy or the data holding area, uh, basically doing that inventory first before we look at any of um, any other provision. Several of you made the point that data is powerful and that we need to look at the protection of it uh, very carefully and focus on harms and uh, put our attention on what the harms are in addressing uh, those defined harms instead of trying to uh, go about solving problems that don't yet exist and don't exist. So, and Larry, I'll have to tell you, you talked a little bit about uh, paragraph four, uh, 58 of the Net Neutrality Act, and I got to tell you, I, I really think that what we need to do is rewrite that particular paragraph along with rewriting paragraph 84. And we could rewrite it so that consumers have flexibility and can subjectively uh, decide where they want their firewalls rather than the uh, FCC subjectively deciding and having flexibility on what they decide they want to address that day. So. I'm free today if you are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, and that's H.R. 96. <laughs> we have an answer for that one, too. Uh, again, thank you all so very much for taking your time to share in with us this morning. I think that the privacy, the data security issue is one that is going to stay with us. Um, I, along with many of you, want to be certain that Congress is very thoughtful and very careful as we move forward on this issue and we appreciate your participation and your good thoughts and guidance on the issue. Thank you for joining us.